So I'll go ahead and just uh, briefly introduce Liz, and, and I really just want to thank her uh, for coming back. Uh, two weeks ago, you came on and shared uh, your thoughts and, and your latest book, uh, Women, Meditation, and Power, uh, which is really beautiful to share. Uh, that's a talk that we need to do again, um, probably every week. So uh, keep that in mind in the future. We'd love to have you touch on that again. And uh, so I really just want to welcome you from the Bay Area, uh, spending time with us on a Saturday afternoon. And for everybody else who's here, uh, welcome. Uh, thanks for joining us um, virtually with the Dharma Bum Temple. Uh, when Liz and I emailed back and forth about what the topic should be, uh, it just seems so perfect to uh, have her speak in general, and then really very specifically to how to practice Buddhism and how to use uh, Buddhism in your life, dealing with the situation, uh, the pandemic that we're, we're going through right now. It's so relevant for all of us, so painful for all of us, and also such an incredible opportunity for growth for all of us. So uh, I'm excited to have Liz back with us. And, and uh, Liz, thank you. And I will turn it over to you. Thank you very, very much. I appreciate it. Um, let's see, I'm going to change my view here. Just one second. Um, okay, speaker view, okay. Um, what I would uh, like to talk about today is, as, as Jeff said, we are going to be covering the pandemic and Buddhism. And I'll start, I think the very first thing we should do is meditate because that is the essence of our practice. And that's the essence of how everyone on this call and everybody who's going to listen to this talk in the future is going to have an amazing transformation and change and growth time throughout this period. It's obviously a very challenging period for many reasons, but first let's meditate. And then, then we're going to, I'm going to go into a lot of different thoughts on this area that represent probably my thinking, but also I think a lot of Buddhist thinking in general. So I'm going to give you a few instructions. I gave the same instructions of my last presentation. This is a way of meditating that uh, I learned from my teacher. His name was Rama, Dr. Frederick Lenz. This is the way he taught the public and the way I meditated uh, for many, many years. It's focusing, it's, it's meditation is always about focus and taking one thing that you could focus on as hard as you can. And then if you get to a point of stillness, you let go into silence. That's the whole idea of meditation, whether it's mantras or yantras or breathing, you're focusing. And then you want to, at some point, let go of that focus and go into stillness. So the way I'm going to show you how to meditate involves what is called the chakras. You probably all know about them. They're seven energy centers along your spine. They're displayed on the walls of yoga classes and the acupuncture deals with them too. But there are seven main ones. And I'll just briefly summarize base of the spine, uh, right in the middle between your belly button and your uh, base of the spine is another one. Right below the belly button, about two fingers below is called the power center. And we're gonna to return to that. Then moving up the spine, we have a chakra or center right in the center of the chest. And that's called the heart center. And then moving on up, we have a chakra or energy center right in the throat. And that's for intuition and creativity. Then moving up again, right in the middle here at the forehead, third eye, there's another energy center and that's intellect and knowing and seeing. And then above the head, there's what's called the seventh chakra, a crown chakra. So we have these seven energy centers along the spine. Good, so how are we going to meditate? Well, we're going to focus on three of these energy centers because these energy centers are actually real. They help bring those qualities associated with the energy center into your being. So what we're first gonna do for about a couple of minutes, and I will time this, I'm gonna ask you to raise or to focus for now for your first center, just focus on this power center. I want you to touch your two fingers just below your belly button. I want you to feel it. 
And I want you to focus there. And if you would like, because it does help picture a very pretty golden luminous orb of yellow golden sunflower light there. We're gonna focus there for about three minutes and in silence. And then we're going to raise our attention and I will say something right to the heart center, right in the center of your chest. You can find that by the way, just by saying me and pointing yourself to yourself. It's always right here, right in the center of your chest. So we're gonna focus there and I'd like you to picture a beautiful blue luminous orb of light. I'll repeat this as we do this. And then we'll, as our third final part of the meditation, we're gonna focus right here in the center of the forehead. We're raising our energy up. We're taking the attention of our mind right here to the center. Right here, we'll picture white light, an orb and focus. So power center, heart center, third eye, and that will be our meditation. So I would like you to everyone to sit up straight and close their eyes. By the way, I asked Kate to put up on the screen. It doesn't help really to look at me. So just let me say one more thing. Uh, a, a very pretty flower, because another way you can meditate if you feel you're struggling with thoughts, open your eyes and focus on this really pretty flower that's on the screen. And the way you do that is just choose one little piece of the flower like a tiny tip of a petal. Now do the same thing. Take your awareness and focus on it as intently as you can while having no other thought. And hold your awareness there for about 15, 20, 30 seconds. And then once you've got that focus going, close your eyes and return to the practice that we were doing. So I think we're gonna just go ahead now and have a really lovely meditation start We'll folk, close the eyes, focus on this golden orb of light that's right here, right below the belly button, your power center. Try to have no other thought in the mind because you're just focusing intensely there. When thoughts come, don't worry, don't pay attention to them. Just come back to your focus. And we will do that for three minutes. And then I will say something.
Okay, now very slowly, raise your awareness to the center of your chest. This is the heart center. And you can feel that blue or visualize the blue orb of light. And you can also feel it pulsating outward. This is your heart center. And just keep your awareness there. Try to have no other thought. It's a beautiful blue light. It's radiating outward. We'll stay here for three minutes. Okay, then um, <clears throat> let's slowly raise our awareness to the third eye in the middle of the forehead and picture a white light there. It's radiating outward, it's diamond bright. When thoughts come into your mind, don't pay attention. Just come back to the white light coming from the center of your forehead. And we will meditate here for about three Three minutes.
Okay, everyone, thank you very much. We will very slowly open the eyes, but take a couple of minutes to do this. Just take one or two deeper breaths. And if you want, you can rub your palms together. Sometimes you rub them together and you feel like just putting them right over your eyes, doing a little massaging right here. Slowly breathing. And then at the very end, when you're ready, it's always nice to do a little bow. It's a bow of gratitude. Just for the opportunity to meditate, just be still or to try, just to have that option. Okay. So when you meditate at home, and um, apologies if I'm repeating what you already know, but it's nice to have a little place set up for your meditation, if you can. Some flowers, some pretty things that inspire you so that when you open your eyes, you're looking at something beautiful. And I think in terms of routine and habit, especially now when we're all self-isolated, I have always tried to meditate twice a day, but now I am sometimes meditating three times a day. And that's because meditation, which means stilling your mind, learning to be in a space where there's no thought, is really the refuge right now, but it's not running away from reality. I wanna really make that point. In Buddhism, when we meditate and practice mindfulness, there should never be guilt on anybody's part. Like, oh, there's all this going on out there and somehow I'm trying to escape it. You are not trying to escape reality. You are discovering reality. <laughs> this, is what, this is what the Buddha taught from the start. And I thought that to explore this topic, which I had fun researching, just to remind myself of all the different great teachers, because to me, Buddhism is not one path. It's an entire tradition that changed from land to land as it found its way there. So there is Tibetan Buddhism and there is Zen Buddhism, which mostly comes from Japan. And there's there's a Thailand stream and there's a China stream. And throughout all these different streams over history, different teachers and, and before the Buddha that we know of, Gautama Buddha in 600, I think it was 583 he was born. He acknowledged prior Buddhas to him because what it means is a state of mind. It's a state of enlightenment. And a state of enlightenment is this huge chorus of incredible, rich, wonderful, dignified, sometimes crazy, wonderful people who got to that state. And then they keep looking at us and say, hey, come on over, <laughs> jump in, the water's great. So there's a lot of different traditions and what they have at their core though, is this central idea of Buddhism. And I thought, you know what, for this talk and because of what's happening right now, Let's just talk about how, what is Buddhism? And what did, what did the Buddha say? He, he said that his teachings are based on the four noble truths. So, you know, I thought it'd be fun to review them because we Americans and Westerners and people in this incarnation right now, we are so accustomed to, uh, you know, we have it pretty decent. We have it flushing toilets. <laughs> we have, running water. We have, I mean, our lifespan in most cases is up to, you know, in many countries up to the 70s. We have 
all things set up prior. Now, prior to this, I'm talking a little bit pre this pandemic. You know, if you want to go out, you went to a restaurant. If you wanted to get in shape, you went to a gym. It was not a bad situation. I think most of us would never have acknowledged that life is suffering. We just never would have said that. But in, in Buddhism, that was the basis of the Four Noble Truths. And that's the base. That's how Buddha taught. He was in, you may know the story. It's a great story. It's about, he was a prince. He had every luxury. His father was trying to keep him in that castle and in that princely world so that he wouldn't leave. And, but one day the Buddha, he was called Siddhartha then. The Siddhartha got out of the gate. And what did he see? He saw a diseased person. And then he saw an older person. And then he saw a corpse. And then he figured it out. Life is really suffering. And truthfully, if you look at that time period, life was absolutely suffering. There, you know, if you were a woman giving incredibly painful childbirth, your kid probably did not live. You know, probably 30% of the kids lived. And everything really was horrible suffering. And he, Siddhartha, just said, this can't be acceptable. And that set him off on his quest. And I think this is so relevant right now because we're off on a quest. We're in a state that I think many of us find unbearable. We read about it, which is an aside, I, and I will expand later, don't recommend that you spend time too much on the news. Just be informed enough. Your job right now is to use a very precious time actually to meditate and be mindful and to become, I think, read books and learn more things and fill your heart and your being with this extra layer of light and knowledge that the Buddha was always talking about and pointing everybody to. So, okay, Four Noble Truths. The life of an unenlightened person, someone who's not even meditating at all, is filled with suffering. And the cause of suffering is a lack of enlightenment, which is caused by your attachment to desires and aversion to suffering. Now, I think that we all have desires and we all have aversions. One of our aversions is to what is happening now in this pandemic. I personally, when I read the news, I, I literally, I just can't stand it almost, I find it so painful. And yet, well, there no, is no and yet. I just know that I can take refuge in meditation and mindfulness and get back to reality, which is not suffering, which is not transient and which is much more true. It lasts through zillions of years, it's eternity. And what we have with this pandemic while as horrible as it is, it is going to pass and we all need to learn from it. And this is then number three, there is a way to reach enlightenment and get beyond suffering we're talking about here. And meditation is the pathway to enlightenment. And that comes from the Buddha. It doesn't come from me or any other teacher who's since followed in his path. He just said, there is a way, there is actually a way. And this is where the body of incredible, to me, when I think of Buddhism, I, it's literally, I think of like an orchestra. I think of a, the most magnificent body of teachers and teachings that have come before and after, and they're all pushing and they're saying there is a way out and it is called enlightenment. And the way there, whatever it may be called in past worlds, but it's meditation, it's still in your thought. It's getting to the point where you can be so still inside that you step into a place of no thought and then you hold your mind there. And that's really the start. That's the start of enlightenment. And that's what we and all Buddhist teachers offer. So I thought, okay, that's really what the core of Buddhism is. And then I thought, okay, the next thing that people always talk about, and I think it's extremely relevant right now although I would upgrade almost every discussion of it to our current terms. But if you remember the Noble Eightfold Path, I thought I'd read it because I think it would be fun to just talk about a little bit of what we can do today 
with this Noble Eightfold Path, it holds us, it gives us a structure. So that Noble Eightfold Path is right understanding, right thought, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, right mindfulness, and right concentration. So we have just started this with right mind, well, certainly right concentration. And I think many of you know about ways to be mindful and techniques. That's just two of these eight steps. But then I thought, well, I want to just for my own understanding, I want to go back to, um, here's my notes here. Okay, so let's look at right understanding. And I don't know about you, but I have a lot of Buddhist books. And here's one, Bing, that little one, it's called the Dhammapada. And if you don't have it, it's um, this small and it's one of the classics. Uh, I know Rama always had it in his pocket, always. And I thought, well, you can tell me if this gets too boring. I'll, I guess I'll tell, but I'll just read a little tab here because this was all written back from the Buddha. So this is perspective giving. In every trial, let understanding fight for you to defend what you have won. For soon the body is discarded. Then what does it feel? A useless log of wood, it lies on the ground. Then what does it know? Your worst enemy cannot harm you as much as your own thoughts unguarded. But once mastered, no one can help you as much, not even your father or your mother. So I thought about that because you see one thing that's quite different here in 2021, in 2020, sorry, we're planning something 21, 20, is that when the Buddha taught, there was no mass media. There wasn't quite, there was suffering, yes, all around. There was transience all around. And I think there was much more awareness that sooner or later we would drop the body. I think much more intense awareness of that. But now we have mass media. And I have to say that because we meditate, that increases, it does increase our and your sensitivity level a bit, maybe a lot. When you are feeling these intense waves of fear or perhaps despair or even hopelessness, all the things that are running around, this is actually being stirred up. I'm not necessarily criticizing it, but I am observing it, that there's incredible pressure to feel these emotions that may or may not be your own. And that's why I think it's important to know that your worst enemy can't harm you. That's, let's say this pandemic, as much as your own thoughts. So when you're sitting there in the suddenly, you're sitting there minding your own business and you're suddenly in a state of panic um, or fear, I'm not even sure those are your own thoughts, but I do believe that this is a time when you pull out your deck of things that you know you can take a deep breath, just breathe in and breathe out and picture light around you as you breathe in and breathe out, picture that light going up and around. And as you breathe out, picture that same, just be in that white light. You're not escaping, you're coming back to your center. And this is supported by every um, Buddhist text I looked at, I thought, okay, here's another one that's, um, where did this one, I put this here, right action. Could, most of these, uh, by the way, I think these rights all overlap each other. And I wouldn't start out with one or the other, but this is from Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind, Shenru Suzuki. Zen is not some kind of excitement, but concentration on our usual everyday routine. And here again, we're self-isolated, we're at home, we have a pandemic, we may be here for a couple months, you know, at least a month, probably 
possibly six weeks longer. What can we do as practitioners? Well, we can be very in the moment when we practice. We can be without fear. We can be hopeful. And by being hopeful, instead of contributing to that wave of energy of fear, we're contributing to the wave of energy of steadfastness and courage and stillness. We're, we're literally injecting a different energy and that is part of our Buddhist compassion. And that is what right action is. So in Buddhism, there's a big emphasis, as you know, on compassion and wisdom. And I think the wisdom is to discriminate. What is you and what is happening across the world? And you may or may not be directly affected, but even so, you have as a Buddhist the tools to remain in a state of calm and light, calm and light. I uh, remember reading just a few days ago, a quote by Eckhart uh, Tolle, who said, well, you naturally you wanna stay in the highest state of awareness you can be at any time for a very practical reason. If you're feeling fear or panic or any of these accompanying sensations, I think overwhelmed is a very frequent one too. You are dropping your immune system because you're giving into these feelings. So I personally am fighting these feelings as a Buddhist. And Buddhists, you may not know this, but I think you might probably do, but Buddhists invented the martial arts. The Buddhists are not passive. <laughs> Buddhists will fight for what they believe to be true. And especially when regards helping people, when your state of mind is calm and clear, you get to help other people. And so yet another, this is, um, I like, um, I'm just gonna run through one or two more here for fun because this is all, this is Buddhist. This is Buddhism in, in action. So I like Thich Nhat Hanh, Vietnamese monk. And the reason I like, he in his writings takes practical stuff that we all go through and then he raises it up to, um, always to infinity and inter eternity and higher states of awareness. But he will start with, I'm walking through the forest and then takes it, takes the whole progression. But here's an, a really neat quote, very optimistic. In my daily life, I want to sow seeds of love and compassion in my own consciousness and in the heart of other people. I am determined not to water seeds of craving, aversion, and violence in myself and the other. I know that if I practice all this in the right way after only seven days, I shall already have been able to change the situation, establish communication, smile and transform some suffering, and increase my happiness. Thich Nhat Hanh, I, actually, I, this is one of your fun readings you can be doing. He does so much writing where you could take any situation and help to transform it in your mind. So I put that somewhere in the right speech category. Gosh, one robe, one bowl. This is all, I, I, I just think it's so poignant and beautiful. When you are feeling like there's just so much desolation. You might bring this one out of your closet or everything is, a lot of these are on Kindle. The rain has stopped, the clouds have drifted away and the weather is clear again. If your heart is pure, then all things in your world are pure. Abandon this fleeting world, abandon yourself. Then the moon and flowers will guide you along the way. Here's another one. I sit quietly listening to the falling leaves, a lonely hut, a life of renunciation. The past has faded. Things are no longer remembered. 
My sleeve is wet with tears. And I really like this one because I am not suggesting that in our Buddhist selves, as we reach for enlightenment, that we are not feeling the pain and suffering of others. Of course we are, but what I am saying is that you do more value, you add more value to this crisis. If you continue fearlessly and without really any stepping aside whatsoever, if you continue on your path toward enlightenment, toward light, because then you are a source of steadiness. You become that source of inspiration. And of course, there's going to be tears on your sleeve. I feel them. But I'm also, and by the way, you know, this meditation technique I just taught you. I am constantly these days centering my awareness in the solar plexus center. That's your power center. There's not much emotion there. So when I feel I'm really getting blown off my balance, but I still need to go forward, you can actually center yourself there. I used to tell this to my women's students and men's students before going into a business meeting. Just center yourself in your solar plexus. Your voice will change. You will be heard. And these are just things we can use. We're Buddhists and we have wisdom and compassion. Finally, here's a thing that many of you probably know about again, but to me, this is a time in this pandemic where the Buddhist teaching is called Tonglen. It may be a Tibetan term, but great path of awakening. And in that one, it's, there's an actual technique where you may know of this. It's very beautiful. And it's very beautiful in the Sangha too, because that way there's never any glitches in the Sangha. It's you, when you breathe in, you breathe in the pain and suffering of others. And when you breathe out, you breathe out light. It's renewed and refreshed. So you breathe in this pain and suffering and you breathe out light, really beautiful, clear light, this pure light that we've been I've referenced once or twice. This is the teaching of the Buddha. The Buddha in the original writings, which I was talking to Kate earlier and saying, I'm rereading the, the Buddhist Bible. And the Buddha is unflinching. You can come to him with any concern and say, and he'll say, no, this is, don't pay attention. This is illusion that there's a higher reality and differentiated light. And this is where you need to be over on this side. And I think for most of us, that's a kind of high aspiration. But I do think that as meditators and as Buddhists with this incredibly rich background, I, I urge you to use this time to read and to study add more sessions to your meditation, truly be mindful and be present. So if you're sitting there and you're washing the floor again and you know, what the heck, and especially if you find yourself, and I do, I literally feel that I'm being hit on the side of the head by some thoughts and feelings I feel that I am feeling things that are going around our world right now due to uh, we're connected. We're connected by media globally. Otherwise you and I would never know what was happening, happening in Italy. We just wouldn't. I'm not saying it should be otherwise. We are now a global community, but I am saying that the anxiety and that fear level, it's like mud, it's like clogging and that it is absolutely possible and desirable not to be in that space. And that's even, I know if you're in healthcare, what I'm saying may be impossible to believe, but I believe that it is there for you because heroism and selfless giving 
is is literally blessed in all Buddhist teaching is the highest. So you just start with that noblest feeling. I am at the highest state of compassion and then start your meditation from there, knowing that you can reach these states of awareness that is discussed. I thought I'd share with you just, and then we'll, I'd like to then have questions, but I have a friend in China and um, I'm gonna share it if I can find it. Okay, otherwise I'll find it later. Ah, here he is, okay. And he's been, so he's been, um, well, here's what he said. I'm now entering into the third month of home, uh, home isolation. I expect this to continue for a couple of more months. It really hasn't been too bad for me. It's easy to fall into a negative mindset reading news and people's comments. It's also easy to get into a positive mindset by just enjoying being with yourself and use this time to achieve something wonderful. I've been working out almost every day on my jujitsu and having loads of fun with my new buddies, workout dummies. My advice, use this time wisely. It's a most precious time and we can achieve amazing things without leaving our homes. So one of the things I've always loved about meditation is it requires no props, it's free. And I've been meditating now for almost five decades. <laughs> and I can tell you that it does work <laughs> over time. It really does. It's really, if you're early in the cycle, just keep at it. They've done scientific measurements. Your blood pressure goes down. Your gray cells go up. Your love and enthusiasm for life under any circumstances increases because you have this perspective, you kind of have a distance. So during a pandemic, it's really important that everybody on this call, I know you do this, but don't feel as a Buddhist, you're not gonna be taking as good of care of yourself for some reason. It's actually the opposite. Just take good care of yourself, eat well, build up your own internal antibodies, I was recently on a call with a bunch of uh, alternatives, you call them holistic type health healthcare providers. And they wanted to come together to see if they had agreement on how to treat the pandemic. And I actually may have some thoughts, which I'll, some, some, I don't think that any conclusions were reached on that call, but they seem close. And if I get anything, I'll send it along to Jeff and they would be nutritional supplements. But the definite answer, which I think we all see, is the prevention side happens in the host. We're, that's us. We're, we're the host. It, the virus is doing what it is doing. And it is very likely that the world out of balance in many ways has caused this virus. But now we have it. So our job, right action, is to just be mindful, we wear a mask, we wear gloves, we do everything you've been told to do. And I think you should be adding more meditation sessions if you can exercise, but be hopeful, be hopeful about the states of awareness that are possible. Buddhism emphasizes states of awareness. And that's what the Buddha's four noble truths were. The fourth was the way out of suffering it's meditation. That's what it's been coming on. And then what we have here is all these beautiful, wow, amazing manifestations. This is, I mean, to me, it's overwhelmingly glorious, honestly. And I, I do love reading some of these books. I hear you have a book club and I'm glad to share some of the books that have inspired me because I read them before I go to bed and I try to read something funny before I go to bed, honestly. I like to go to bed with a laugh or a giggle if there's something funny. And well, how can you laugh or giggle when all the others are suffering? Because if I could do something physically to change this, 
I would, but if I can also send light as we, if I can vibrate a very positive, bright, hopeful vibration, I feel I am doing something really quite amazing. And I think that's what teachers of Buddhism and enlightened people have been doing for such a long time. It's an, an inspiration. So I have more stuff, but I think I'm gonna end that there and see. I know that people on the call have specific questions and situations, and I am really happy to discuss that and see what's on everyone's mind. Thank you. Oh, enter into chat. I don't know if Jeff already said that, but the way we thought we'd handle this is questions on chat. And then um, Kate, I think is gonna, yeah, Kate will read me the question. You'll all hear it and I shall answer as best as I can. Um, I have a question in the chat and actually two that are related, Liz. Um, the first one is what is the Buddhist Bible and some other good books on Buddhism? And the second one is, can you recommend a few books or share the titles of those you mentioned again? Sure, okay. Okay, the Buddhist Bible is uh, edited by, that's it, the Buddhist Bible. It's edited by Dwight Goddard, G-O-D-D-A-R-D. It's the hardest of all the books. I read it. Well, you will go to sleep on this word. But it's, it's, it's a good book. And, and interestingly, I think it has history with the Dharma Bum Temple because Jack Kerouac, that was the book he read. It's an anthology of Buddhist texts. It isn't one thing. And apparently that influenced the early Buddhists, I mean, Zen Buddhists, to embark on the path of Zen Buddhism. So that's one. I myself, I will admit, okay, I'm going to go for the ones that I find. Um, I'll go for light, lighter Buddhist reading every time. Um, so I'm going to start here with, it's not, this is just lovely. Okay, so here's Zen Mind, Beginner's Mind, Shenru Suzuki, and he brought um, he was very bring, big on bringing Zen practice to the United States. I will absolutely get you a book list. Here is Thich Nhat Hanh. Thich is T-H-I-C-H-N-H-A-T-H-A-N-H. -H -H -H. And I think that you can also see a lot of Thich Nhat Hanh on YouTube because he is still with us. And yeah, okay. This is the Zen poetry of Ryokan, one robe, one bowl. And this is just beautiful. Oh, there's so many good books. So we're gonna go through a few. I'll give you guys a great list. And by the way, this list originally, I've added a few to it, but this list originally came from my teacher, Rama, because he wanted us to really be knowledgeable. So there were like a hundred books. <laughs> the Great Path of Awakening. This comes from, um, it's, it, technically it's Tibetan Buddhism, but really, honestly, it's, I think it's, uh, it says, you know, compassionate heart in the midst of everyday life for centuries. And another fun and nice, easy to read, cheerful for nighttime reading is Surfing the Himalayas. And that was a book written by Frederick Lenz some time ago. And it's very clear, very high concepts of Buddhism, but it's in the parable of a snowboarder. It's, a, it's, a, it's the parable of this kid who's like pretty clueless about Buddhism and he meets an advanced monk. So Surfing the Himalayas is a lovely read, and I recommend that. And I also love, love, and I'm inspired by the stories of great teachers. So Jeff, you can jump in here anytime, but I just read 
Well, I love um, Tibet's great yogi, Milarepa, M-I-L-A-R-E-P-A. This guy was kind of a, he had a bad upbringing and then he met an advanced teacher. <laughs> you will love this story. <laughs> Who just makes him build and take down a house like about five times. <laughs> and uh, he went on and he meditated self-isolation for many, many years. And then he came out to teach and is considered one of Tibet's greatest teachers. And I just read recently the life of Marpa, M-A-R-P-A. So Marpa, who was um, Mil Milarapa's teacher, Marpa is so interesting. I don't know how I missed this. I loved it. It was, he set out, he wanted the teachings. And back in those days, now this was around the 13th century, he had to hike, as it were, from um, Tibet into parts of India, literally unpassable. So, I mean, he was up against lions and tigers in little tiny uh, trails with 1,000 foot drops and treachery all over the place, but somehow he made it and he did it three times. And the reason he did, he was called a translator, which was a very high honor. And so he translated Buddhist texts from India, brought them back to Tibet. And also you read and feel the states of awareness that these people had. One of my favorite books, who isn't quote Buddhist, but then again, according to the person I study with, everyone who meditates is a Buddhist. And that's because if you're seeking and you're trying to still your mind, the states of mind that start to filter into your being are the essence of what, you know, Buddhism and Buddha was talking about. He never, my teacher never thought Buddhism was just one person, but anyway, here's one of my favorite, favorite books. And that's Rama Krishna and his disciples. Do you know that one, Jeff? Rama Krishna. I've, was no, I've, I've not read that. Okay. Oh, you'll love it. You guys. It's so Rama Krishna was an enlightened teacher in India in toward the end of uh, about 19, so yeah, toward the early 20th century. And he had great students who came to the US. So a lot of the um, people that you see in the world of Vedanta came from him. But Ramakrishna and his disciple, Ramakrishna was just this wild, wonderful person. He was in, probably enlightened at a very early age. He explored every teaching, including Buddhism. When he wanted to learn about uh, female de deities, he dressed in women's clothes for two years. He was just a totally great badass guy. <laughs> and uh, so that's, and it was written by, by the way, this was written by Christopher Isherwood. So it's lovely, well-written. And um, I think I can give you a few more that you will like, but I, I think that does it. I think the point is, is that um, I'll give you a list of books that will not all be, that will be kind of, entertaining but incredibly educational and to show you and demonstrate that these states of awareness we're talking about are attainable and they have been attained and then every different teacher that gets to them at a certain age or culture might express them differently okay i'll get you a little further list Next question. I think we had a hand raised. Tomoko, did you have a question you wanted to ask? Tomoko? I think she said no. I think that was an accident. Uh, she was just scratching her head. Yeah. Uh, in the chat right now. <laughs> Other questions, you can either raise your hand or just type in the chat. If you're inspired, then everybody should drop off this call and meditate again. <laughs>
that's to me just part of what we're talking about. You know, just there's no rules about this. If you want to sit and just have 10 minutes of meditation, another nice thing if you feel like you're straining, I'm going to meditate now. You know what's nice is just to, while you're meditating, put a little smile on your face. Like that, first of all, pops some of those nice little endorphins, but it also helps you remember that what you're doing is tapping into this like inner nectar sort of part of your being. And, um, but yeah, a little spontaneity here with, hey, things are a little insane. I'm feeling totally out of it and I'm gonna sit to meditate. Why? Because I'm gonna stop my, try to stop my thought. My thoughts are trying to kill me for God's sake. You know? And it's not helping. If you could help by getting worried and panicked, I would be all for it, but you can't. You're actually tilting in a direction. Oh, I do have one more thing to tell you though. Do we have time? Do I have one more thing to tell everybody? Okay. I have one more question for you first, actually, Liz, and I think this is a quick one. Um, Katie wanted to know, what book did you reference that was your pocket book, the one to bring in a person? Oh, I forgot that it got buried. Yes, it's the Dhammapada. It, you know, I think it fell down on the ground. Here it is. You know what's neat? It's still on Amazon. This has been around, oh, wow, this has been around forever. And as I said, um, Rama used to have two books he said he always read. One was the Dhammapada. He said, read it every day. It's got little pithy, little aphorism type stories. It's very lovely. And the other was The Art of War by Sun Tzu. And I think all of you guys probably would benefit from reading The Art of War. Why? Another Buddhist book. The Art of War is about survival techniques. And it's not necessarily about war. It's really about streetwise. And Buddhist, Buddhists are smart, you know, remember. In the Buddhist monasteries of Tibet, and I, I, I can't say the same thing only because I don't know as much in, in the Zen monasteries, but I know that in the, if you went to Tibet and you got into a monastery, you were studying your brains out because you need to have a sharp mind and speaking of a sharp mind, one of the, I was going to say under right livelihood, if anyone on this call is struggling right now, you, maybe you're out of a job or maybe the job is not going anywhere or just put you in a situation you're not happy with. Um, Rama recommended always, always tech, computer science. And you can go for six months to a computer science I know in LA, they had one called um, Computer Dojo. And in six months of you working really hard, you would learn how to code and they would help you get your first job. And once you get your first job in computer science, you are, you are set. And the reason he liked it is back to the Tibetan monks. I'm not digressing. They studied astrology and they studied math. And the reason they did is that so when they meditated, that focus capability was strengthened. It's not easy to focus. As, that's my dog. My dog's a focusing. All right, you can be quiet now. Okay, I'll, let's see. They're, they're focused on barking, you guys. Okay. <laughs> okay I'm going to let them out. Just give me one second because this is an important point. Is that... Um, I recommend, give me one second. All right, you're going outside. <laughs> hey, I stepped away for a second, Kate. Did did someone answer or did, uh, the question? She was talking about the Dhammapada, the small pocket book. Okay. Uh, okay. 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 What I'm saying is that right, right livelihood for Buddhists according to the person I studied with is a, is a mental career. So the sharper the mental career, the better. And that's actually how I ended up going from uh, 
although public relations was good and marketing it was, I could have stayed, but I was so drawn to learn about technology. And what we're finding now, I have a friend who teaches here in the Bay Area and all of his students, so there's different age groups who've been there different lengths of times. The ones that got established in technology, not one of them has been laid off. They're all still working at the same really hot, ridiculously high rate <laughs> that they've always gotten. Um, the newer ones are sort of 50-50, but they're in line. They're not like, they're just while the companies figure things out. And there's a new wave that's gonna be learning. And if you go to a coding dojo, let's call that for six months, you will have the training you need to get your first job. And once you get your first job, I believe people who meditate are bright. You're capable of communicating very well and you kind of get a situation in a broader sense. So you are such an asset. So I was gonna tell you that right livelihood, even if you think, no, that can't be me. Actually, it could be you. There's no math involved usually. It's usually logic. And these people have it in, it's in their own best interest to help you. And you can get student loans. So I would use, if I were to give advice on right livelihood today for Buddhists, that technical career advice is really a winner. It's prescient. It'll you. It will help you for the rest of your life, and you will never stay at the same rung you start at. And you'll get. You'll go up. <laughs> I'm laughing because I read stories about the government's technical systems are so behind. <laughs> but that's a whole different story. Liz, I have another. Oh, sorry. Okay. I have another question for you in the chat, if you have time. Before you mentioned setting, before you mentioned setting up a place for meditation for beginners, what items would you recommend to use to set up your altar and their meanings? Okay, good question. Um, well, if you can get without, you know, safely somewhere to get flowers into your vase, I would have flowers on the table. I think um, you can have some things that inspire you if there's truly any imagery or just something that kind of makes you feel happy. You might call them little power objects that might be some uh, decorative things. I, my, my table, you, you can ha have a picture of your teacher or not, or a teacher, but you might have a, a statue of the Buddha there. You can have, I would just make it a pretty place with a pretty fabric. And uh, you see behind me, there's these Buddhist tankas. There's, you can get those online. I think have fun with it. And um, meditation tools, there's visual things like yantras. I think for me, I would go for the flower, maybe a candlestick and an incense burner because incense sometimes is nice too. There's one more. I'm not sure if it was meant seriously because there's a little smiley face next to it, but I think it's a really good question. So I'm going to share okay. it with you. <laughs> okay. How do we meditate with dogs in our space? How? Well, hopefully they're not barking all the time. Um, mine bark occasionally and they don't actually, they leave me alone while I meditate. You know, it depends on the dog. You could have a dog touching you. I don't think it's really a problem in any way. Uh, mine just leave me alone. They go, oh, she's meditating. <laughs> no fun for us. Um, yeah, I think, I, I guess I don't know the circumstances well enough, but dogs usually like the energy of meditation. And they usually recognize that you come out of meditation in a pretty nice state of mind. Reminder, anger. So anger is something that can come up, but don't let it stay there in meditation. If you're meditating and finding yourself getting angry in the thoughts, just open your eyes, break it. Don't let it sit. Because anger, you know, again, one of the Buddhist poisons, it'll, it'll lower your awareness. 
And I know when I first started it, there was this thing, well, thoughts are release of stress. But now I know that's not true. <laughs> thoughts are thoughts. So if you have anger, uh, this is not the time. In fact, really, that's when you want to practice mindfulness. So if you're, uh, well, that, that's why when you finish meditating, you should be in a nice, happy state of mind because you relaxed, nothing else, you relaxed, your body, you know, should have settled down, your breath settles down. These are all the things they've measured. You've tapped, it, you know, again, do different ways of meditation. There's some really lovely ways to meditate. Uh, you can chant a mantra at the start of your meditation to get you started. So one nice mantra that I have used and still do to chant maybe seven times is the mantra sring, S-R-I-N-G. And that is a mantra of harmony and beauty. So it's like sring. String. String. If you guys do that seven times before you meditate and maybe seven times after you meditate, you've created a little seal around your meditation practice. And then I think your dogs will be so happy. But other than that, if they're bugging you, you have to leave them out of the room. Sorry. <laughs> Anyone else have any questions before we, we sign off and let Liz? Go for the day. Anything anyone else wants to share or ask? There was a message here. Oh, sorry, Kate, but there was a message here. It says, thank you, Liz. Take good care, everyone. I appreciate The Art of Living by Thich Nhat Hanh and A Monastery Within by Gil Fransdahl. Two also really good books. Yeah. That was from John. He said, thank you, Liz. Sure. Well, thank you guys for tuning in. And I wish everybody the best and good health and good safety. And lots of inner light and transformation in your practice, which you are now being forced to do. <laughs> yeah. Liz, thank you so much. Katie said you made my day. Thank you, Liz. Okay, great. Bye -bye. So thank you all for being here from the Dharma Bum Temple. And thank you, Liz, again, for your time. A tremendous honor always to host you and have you share your, your heart and your wisdom with us. So thank you. And again, Kate, thanks for hosting and moderating and Travis setting all the technical side up um, as well. So we appreciate everybody. Yeah. Made this happen. So thanks, Liz. Yeah.